Hey bookends. Welcome to a 10 min check-in. I'm 10. So today's check-in is going to be on self-othering. Now the practice of self-othering is when someone looks at a people or a culture or a way of life that is similar to theirs but they feel disconnected from it for one reason or another. This isn't the idea of I'm better than such and such because of. It's more so why don't I fit in or I don't fit in. So it's not a good feeling. It's actually a bad feeling. I bring this up because I was reading a book that I really, really, really was looking forward to. Rebel Sisters. There's going to be a review on this. And this book is awesome. There are so many uh, Afrofuturism uh, reference in it, references in it. There's so much Afrofuturism. Although someone from Africa who's reading it might say it's African Futurism. So they would make some make that <coughs> distinction. And this has been a, a back and forth kind of thing with the black community and the African community. This distinction between Afro-futurism and African futurism. And although I'm on, I would say, neither side of the fence, I'm in the middle because, you know, black is black. We're all the same color and so by theory, and we also share a lot of the same sentiments, so by theory we'd have similar, if not the same, projections, even though what we want might be slightly different, the projections would probably be the same. But I bring that up because as I read this book, as it speaks about different um, languages in the continent of Africa, different meldings of traditions and things that would be found in the continent of Africa. It is so enlightening. It is so inspiring. But to a degree, it's it's othering. I find myself self-othering, like wishing that I could somehow be seen in this book. You know, being black in America is such an uh, odd thing. It really is. Um, so me personally, I have, of course, African heritage. I have slave heritage, so African heritage. I have native heritage. My grandmother was full native. My grandfather was half native. And um, half native, half black. And it's it's interesting that being black in America, you're not a square peg, you're not a round peg, you're a square shaped peg with round edges, if that makes any sense. We look very similar to Africans. So those of us who have native heritage in us, most of us don't appear native. We just don't. So we have more African-esque features in us. So in that way, we're more of a square, right? But when we look at African culture, when we're confronted with African culture, with uh, African sentiments, we only match up to a degree because, of course, when the slaves were brought here, our language was stolen from us, names were beaten out of us, sentiments were beaten out of us. So when we are speaking to someone who is a native of Africa or we're matched up against someone who's a native of Africa we don't quite measure up we don't quite uh, match up and so there's that othering that takes place that we're similar but we're, we're not the same and it, it's not a, a good feeling and try as I might with this book now I love this book. There is nothing wrong with Rebel Sisters at all. Highly recommend Rebel Sisters. I'm towards the middle of it right now. So there's nothing at all wrong with this book. I find myself feeling like, okay, I wish I could see myself in this. And it's sad because the characters are black. 
they're they're African for the most part. They are African. Like Nigerian, Ghana, like they're African. But Okay, to give you an example of, of why it is I feel, feel this way. When I was younger and uh, there was an influx of people from Ghana and Nigeria moving into New Jersey back in the early 2000s. So there was like a big influx, a surge. And at that point, I called myself African American. A lot of us called it, I call myself black now. I don't call myself African American. I call myself black now because I think black encompasses more of my experiences than African American would. Um, but I'd met a lot of African kids, you know, not so much adults. They had their parents, but you know, you're a kid, so you meet kids because you're a kid. And it was such an othering experience. Like, no, we're not the same. You were a slave. We weren't slaves. And like, what are you talking about? You know, it was a very othering experience. And it wasn't just the African kids who were saying things. It was the black kids that were saying t things too. The black kids were saying that they were dirty and, and things like that. So it was both of us, even though we had similar heritage, looking at each other like we're not the same now when I became a teenager everything is was different because you know as a teenager it's like okay well all holds are off and it's time to date so um, I, th I think I dated two African guys I'm not sure I'm not at once but I believe yeah and uh, one of my best friends married an African guy so like as a teenager that othering feeling kind of went away because everyone was just trying to, to pair up teenager to yeah early 20s everyone was just trying to pair up and match up you know so it didn't really matter it's just hey you're cute and you're single and I'm cute and I'm single so let's be cute and together kind of a deal I find myself as I get older as I delve back into the literary world and and uh, reach out to make friends and things of that nature. I find that when I'm talking to African people, when I'm in the presence of African people as an adult, there is not an othering. There is a, hey friend, you know, we're, we're all together. There's not an othering, it's just we're all in this together. But when I read black when I read African literature, when I see African programs, I enjoy them, but I feel like I'm not included. I almost feel like I don't have the right to be included, if that makes sense. Like I'm not African enough to be included in it. I'm reading another book called The Marrow Thief. Let me just get the author's name. This is by a native. Uh, Cherie Demelaine. She wrote another book as well. And I know some people are irritated by the term native. But no, I am half native. So the reason why I choose to use native, the reason why my grandmother chose to use native, the reason why other people in my family choose to use native is because we are not Indian. We did not come from India. And indigenous is another term that most, that some, I'm not going to say most, some find othering. I find indigenous othering. Like I am a native of this land. I did not come from someplace else. Or if I did, my people did come from somewhere else. It was thousands of years ago. I am a native of this land. And the other half of me that is black was placed on this land, stolen and placed on this land. So, you know, I literally have no place else to go. I am native to this land. So, yes, I use the term native. Um, but, yes, The Marrow Thief is written by natives. And reading that, the experiences in that book, and there's another book that I read um, about natives as well, the sentiments are similar.
to the sentiments that I have, the sentiments that I was raised with, the stories are similar, like the folk stories are similar to the ones that I was raised with. And when I'm in the presence of other Native people, like when I'm physically in the presence of other Native people, I don't feel othered. I feel brothered, like sistered, like I feel the same. But when reading literature with Natives or when watching shows with Natives or movies with Natives, sometimes it feels othering. And I'm not 100% sure why that is. I'm pretty... I believe that the othering comes from feeling encapsulized, like the way that we're raised from a young age in this country to feel like, like I didn't know when I was younger that the, the slaves had been dropped off in other places. We didn't know about Brazil. We didn't know about Haiti. We didn't know about the Dominican Republic. We knew that there were some darker skinned people from those areas. We didn't know that the slaves had been dropped off there because that wasn't something that we were told. We were encapsulized and said, your history began right here at slavery. That's when your history began, right there. And although we were aware of natives, the information that we got in school was like, yay, everyone was friends, but some people got sick and then they died. As opposed to what I actually heard from my grandmothers who were saying like, no, our tribes were split up, our women were raped, and we were some of us were made into slaves. I know my um, great-grandmother, her name her real she she didn't remember her real name because that was taken but her americanized name was mary blakely and that's because the people who owned the plantation where she was born on to um named her mary and the master's name was blakely and so when her parents got free you know got a last name they didn't take Blakely they took Blake they, they shorted, shortened it for some reason don't know but then my grandmother was taken from my my great okay my great grandmother was taken from her parents along with other native children so that they could uh, integrate better into American society so if she was taken at a young age away from them um, and they lived in a, I don't know if you want to call it a mission or, or something like that where they put children, where they force children into Catholicism or force children into, I don't want to say Catholicism, but force them into Christianity or that version, that false version of Christianity where, you know, people are being forced to do something. So yeah, my grandmother was put, my great grandmother was put into one of those with a bunch of other children. And when she was finally an adult, she, I believe she was made to marry my great grandfather. I don't believe that was an option for her because they wanted her to integrate. So she was made to marry someone who was a part of the church. And when she was finally able to go back to her family, she said what hurt her the worst was that she couldn't understand the language anymore. Like that language had been taken from her. And so in a way she had been othered, even though she looked exactly like these people, these customs had been forced upon her, this way of life had been forced upon her, a language had been forced upon her, and she was othered. And she did the best that she could to instill those ways that she was able to recover and her children, which is my grandmother, and my grandmother did the best that she could Everyone did the best they could, but now, three generations, four generations later, there are people like me who are aware of our heritage, who believe in our heritage, who love our heritage, but who have very little to no connection to it. And, yeah, I say all that to say, self-othering is an interesting it, it is an interesting thing. It is a very interesting thing. And I try to avoid self-othering because it's not a good feeling. Once again, it's not a better than feeling. It's a why don't I fit in feeling. <coughs> Interestingly enough, the 
uh, Tristan Strong series. I'm also reading this. I'm reading a lot of things. I have a lot of hats. A lot of hats. The Tristan Strong series. Uh, the first book in the series, Tristan Strong Punches a Hole in the Sky, where it talks about Anansi and Tara Baby. I wanted to do a review on that book, but I couldn't. As odd as it may sound, when I read the first book, I was so happy. I was happy and sad in a way. I was happy that all these stories that my great grandmother had told me, like she died when I was nine and she was a hundred and and one I think when she died or a hundred and something birthdays are kind of odd when you're born on a plantation but when she before she died she told us all these stories about tar baby and about Anansi and about all these other like folk stories and you know about the wolf folk isn't the same as wolf spirit you know or the coyote folk aren't the same as coyote spirit and what dream catches for like she told us all these different things but it, once again, it was encapsulized because it felt like we were the only ones who knew this. This was our family thing. This is just us. So it, we were encapsulized. It, it was just us. But reading this book with Tristan Strong punches a hole in the sky, it's like, this isn't us. This is everyone who's had, who has native heritage, who has slave heritage, who who has African heritage, like these stories didn't just belong to us, They so many other people know these stories as well. And that made me so happy because it's like, yes, I was telling my sister, like this is great, other people know this, it's not just us. But then also too, it was kind of saddening because I also wanted to like tell my grandma, like, hey grandma, look at all this, like other people know this too, but she's not around. So there's, you know, no way for me to tell her that at this point. So emotionally, I could not do a review for, I couldn't do an honest review for that book. I could not because I was too emotionally attached to it, if that makes any sense. I couldn't, I couldn't give an honest review because it, it, it would have been all tens based on my emotional connection to it, not the actual work itself. Tristan Strong destroys the world. This will get a review because I have emotionally distanced myself a bit. But yes, and also too, in this one, the characters are a little pushed away, so to say, like Anunzi's on a cell phone. So yeah, because he was captured. Anyway, not going to give away any, any spoilers with that. But yes, self-othering is not a fun experience. I don't recommend it for anyone. And I am working on not feeling different, and I can say that the African booktubers that I'm friends with on booktube and on Twitter and on Instagram they have all been so kind none of them have ever looked at me and said okay well you're you're not African you're you're black we don't we don't deal with you you one of them slave folk we don't deal with you they have never done anything like that and I can honestly say that most of the African people that I've met in my teenage years and adulthood have not done anything like that. It was only when I was a kid, and I have to be 100% with that, the black kids, you know, the African American kids, the black kids, they were, they were giving it out too. So it wasn't like, you know, the African kids were picking on us, like no. Everyone was going back and forth. Once hormones got into play, they was like, okay, you know what? I can't call you ugly anymore. <laughs> Do you want to date? Yeah, so I am actively working on self-othering, but I'm wondering if other people in other cultures self-other as well. Like if white people in America, you know, let's just say that if they had English heritage and they read a book about someone in England, do they feel othered by that? Like, do they feel like, okay, well, this is interesting and I wish I could be, I wish I could feel more connected to this person, but I can't, even though heritage-wise we're the same. Or is that just something for black people or African Americans who are forced to abandon a good percentage, a good amount of their heritage? And when we hear it again, or we hear it, I should say, for the first time after that abandonment, feel like, oh, wow, that's interesting. I wish I could be a part of that, but I know that I'm not, even though I want to be. <sighs> So any of my uh, friends on YouTube or Instagram or what have you that are African, if you could give me your input on this, on this self-othering, and do you feel self-othered? Like, 
anyone at all do you feel self-othered when you look at someone or read content that comes from the people of your heritage when you look at it now do you feel othered am i saying like something happened 100 years ago i'm saying like someone who's writing something right now or a show right now like something that's currently happening when you look at it or read it or engage with it is there any self-othering that happens is there any feelings of i wish i belonged but I know that I don't. And if you do have those feelings, how do you get over them so that you don't feel so bad? Yeah. Well, thank you so much for watching and for checking in with me while I checked in with you. And yes, I am shiny. It is eczema season for me. So if I am not shiny, I am scaly. So I am going to be shiny. I choose to shine, darling. Thank you so much for watching. If you like what you see, please like and subscribe. Bye, bookends.